given world history here at AUC. Um, and I'm also the director of the Awali Center for American Studies and Research, uh, which is uh, sponsoring today's debate, co-sponsoring with the uh, Political Science Students Association. So uh, welcome to all of you. We're delighted that you're here. Uh, just a, a quick word about uh, CASAR, in case you've never heard of us. We uh, do exist in a little office next to TBS. There's actually a big sign, a big fancy sign over, over the door, but uh, most people walk right by th that door on their way to TBS and have never noticed that there is a door there. But anyway, that's where our offices are. We uh, uh, welcome you to, to step in and, and uh, say hello to us anytime. Um, so CASAR was established in 2003 by uh, Prince al Walid of the Saudi royal family after the attack, the attacks of 9-11, uh, 2001 uh, in the United States in order to build cultural understanding between uh, the Middle East and uh, the West. And so uh, he came up with the idea of establishing six uh, different study centers. Um, he he uh, established two American study centers, one here uh, in Cairo and one in Beirut, so two in the Middle East, and then two in the UK and two in America. So there's an Islamic study center at Cambridge and an Islamic study center um, at uh, Edinburgh in the UK, and then uh, same thing at uh, Harvard and at Georgetown. Uh, these were all established and, and run by uh, money from the, the Al-Wali family, so, uh, from, from Prince Al-Wali. So anyway, that's how we came into existence. That's how we're here, and that's why we have an interest in talking about uh, the results of the American election. So to handle that part of it, I'm going to turn it over uh, to my uh, colleague and friend, uh, Ambassador al -Ali. I don't see any of my students here. <laughs> You're all going to fail. <laughs> anyway, hello everybody. I'll be very, very short because I want to give much time to you. Uh, I'm sure all of you have followed the elections, have seen uh, the sweeping victory of uh, Trump, uh, not expected by many people, including myself. Uh, anyway, uh, for the purpose of this uh, talk or this seminar or whatever you talk, competition, let me concentrate on two things. Uh, the perception of Trump of the Arab world and the Arab world's perception of being Trump. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you followed the debate between Trump and Biden. How many? One, two, three, four. Uh, when it came to discussion on the Middle East, Trump simply started by accusing Biden of being a Palestinian. And this was meant as an insult and it was meant as something negative. So this is to be uh, the one uh, set up of uh, Trump. Also, during that uh, debate, uh, Trump was very, very clear about. You know, his support to Israel and that what Biden was doing was not helping to uh, Israel. And then when it came to the debate between Trump and uh, Paris, uh, Trump was uh, better in terms of the rhetoric, and he tried to depict himself as pro-Arab by accusing Paris of not only hating Israel, but also hating the Arabs. And uh, it was a clever move on his part. And we've seen during the campaign how Trump managed to get some of the Arabs and Muslims in Michigan to uh, appear with him in one of these uh, events, while Harris has failed to even uh, bring a Palestinian speaker during the uh, convention of the Democratic uh, Party. So uh, elections is something, but it tells me something also. 
I mean, it doesn't mean that what Trump has said during the election time is going to be translated into action in his administration. One of the things he said was that uh, Israel should finish off the job. It doesn't mean that Trump is going to give Israel a carte blanche. You know what's carte blanche, okay? Because this is my French. It stops you. <laughs> and uh, although he is in full support of uh, Israel, although uh, you surely you know what he did in his first administration, moving the embassy to. Uh, Jerusalem and recognizing Israel's uh, sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Most people forget the second part. They only remember the first part. Uh, anyway, uh, and so people assume that Trump will come and will be very supportive to uh, Israel and will give everything uh, everything Israel wants without it. That's not the case. This is another discussion. And. I hope, I, I hope to listen from you about that. All right, so it's, before you start, has everyone signed their name and email so we can contact you in case you want? Do you have it? Hands up. All right, I will ask you to kindly state your name, first and last name, before you state your opinion so we can just get the comment and the name down. Right? Yeah. Is it all right? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Or it's all yours. Two. Anybody wants to start the question? All right. So, our question for today is simple. We can argue either side, but it addresses whether is the election and that Trump won, is that affecting the Middle East positively or not? So, anyone can jump right in. Go ahead. Hi. Start off. Please name and go ahead. So, Sorry, name, but so uh, I basically feel that it's very early now to say like whether it's like uh, it's a good it's gonna be a good thing for us or not. But I'm talking like as a Lebanese person, like I'm gonna like I'm not gonna deal talk about like the internal policy that both candidates were like uh, saying about America because I'm not American. I'm gonna like. Talk about like what they said about their, their international policy, and then like Kamala, like she never like mentioned Lebanon. Whether like Trump like was like uh, getting helped by like a guy called Masad Boulos, which is like the father of his girl's husband, who is Lebanese, and like he tried uh, a lot to campaign for him, like for like Lebanese American society in the U.S. in Michigan specifically. And then like he like wrote a paper, he sent the paper like to Lebanese people, telling them that. When he's gonna be president, he's gonna promote peace and try like uh, to promote peace for the Lebanese people. I know that he also like supports Israel and also Kamala. So like for me, like I cannot know, I cannot predict what he's gonna do. But like based on his like promises and like based what he talked about, he is promoting for peace. And I'm hoping that he's gonna like do as he promised and like like somehow. Like negotiate and put pressure on like all like stakeholders in this world to like try to end it as soon as possible. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Khalifa Fontori, and I believe that the results will impact the Middle East negatively. My first point is Trump said that he will not only support pro-Israel agenda at first, uh, since it's it's not even in his priorities. Of, his campaign it was not a spirit that's going to support the Arab world. It was just mentioned to gain his publicity, to gain the publicity of the Arab world. And it is we should not forget that he did uh, make Jerusalem that capital of uh, Israel. And uh, as mentioned, he re reassured their control over the Palestinian territory. In conclusion, I believe that Trump is an unpredictable president, and we cannot we cannot be certain that his, pre uh, his presidency would impact the Middle East positively in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Asim Uh So, I don't think it's a straight up uh, yes. He will positively like uh, impact uh, the Middle East, but I I feel like it's a possibility because. I remember there was an interview where he said that uh, regarding the Russia-Ukraine war, 
He said that if I was president, that war would end in like 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but saying, well, of course, it's not necessarily something that's true. But uh, like something about Trump is that he doesn't like spending money on helping foreign uh, powers like Europe and like military aid. And the U.S. does fund the Israel he heavily, and the U.S. funds, of course, other countries heavily. But uh, maybe that's one thing that would stop him from maybe funding Israel. It's not necessarily true that he would be against uh, Israel fighting against Hamas. Uh, but it's like. Honestly, to like probably just show that he's better than Biden or from that uh, administration, he's probably going to try to solve both Russia and Ukraine and potentially also Israel and uh, Palestine. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the question of pausing the room. I'm oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I will call the question. Are you in China? Are you in China? Yeah. Uh, I think the question of positive and negative here is it's like negative and more negative. And that's how we balance it out because I don't think there's any positive between both of the campaigns. So if we're talking about positive, that would just be a little bit less negative. So uh, what we're talking about here, less negative, in terms of less negative, I think uh, definitely Trump's victory is less negative, thus positive here. So the positive points of Trump's victory is that the Republican foreign policy is more about disengagement. They would not engage, they will step back, they will just uh, let it play out as it has. But Trump uh, and the Democrat uh, foreign policy is more about intervention. I mean, it's very narcissistic that they think they are the superior power in the world and that they need to intervene and make things right. But uh, in terms of uh, uh, Israel and Palestine and many Arab things uh, right, that are going on right now, intervention is something they need. So in that term, it is positive. And secondly, the foreign policy of the Republicans, which would be giving aid to Israel for uh, uh, for its attacks on Palestine, which is again a negative uh, point because Israel would be more likely to attack. It would, the situation will only worsen. But in terms of Democrats, they are much more mindful about that. And thirdly, in their campaign, uh, like uh, my colleagues here mentioned before, Kamala never mentioned Arabs. She's not mindful of Arabs. She doesn't think about them. She didn't even try to campaign for them as much. In the meantime, Trump has it in the back of his mind that there is a population of Americans who are Arabs who have a say in what's going on. And uh, he, he, since he's mindful of that, there is a possibility that he will, if he's not 100% going to vote in favor of or do things in favor of Arabs, I'm sure there is something that, it, that the Arabs are going to get out of this uh, uh, Trump's victory. Uh, if it's nothing, if it's not 100% of what they want, at least 20%, 30%, which is better than what they would get from Kamala, which is nothing. She doesn't even think about it. Um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Hassan and Nunk. Um, personally, I believe that Trump is, is, the, is possibly the worst president for the Middle East. And, 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 and all, I think in all US history, and the reason for this is that people are forgetting in Trump's first term, not only did he um, recognize the Golan Heights as Israeli territory and has a settlement named after him called Trump Heights, not only did he cut all the US aid to, to Palestine onto the future, not only did he even uh, implement a Muslim ban, which uh, banned people from all across the Middle East and South Asia into uh, uh, becoming the US, which is very racist. He also, uh, he also is very, um, He's also he's also a problem. If you look at them on the on the, on the micro scale, he was found for he was found he, he racially discriminated against tenants in uh, Queens, New York. He also um, was found guilty of sexual abuse. And he's not he's not the type of person who I would who I would uh, he's not the type of person who I would count on uh, being moral or being just. I don't. I don't think he's like like the, the thing about Kamala. She kind of cop, she kind of goes with the status quo. She's like she maybe she will like stay like under the Biden administration. If we have thirty days to allow more aid into Palestine, they'll 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 still fund Israel, but like with some limitations. They follow what every president has done, which is being slightly Zionist with a like tinge of pro-Palestinian two-state solution. But the the so yeah, that's 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 a, that's what I that's what I think. I think that. The compare Kamala kind of follows the status quo while Trump is possibly the, the most Zionist candidate you could that's gonna have been voted into the US. Uh, 
I don't know. Just we're, just we're, we're just going to get some other people. We, we can come back to you. You're allowed to speak again, but <laughs> we'll get a few other voices first. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sara Tore. So, my name is Sara Tore. Uh, so, I, I think that uh, we have to look at two, the two candidates. Uh, through the lens that there are also other factors that contribute to their foreign policy in the Middle East uh, that is uh, independent from them a person as a personal leaders, including a Zionist lobby and the APAC. They have great, great influence on their foreign policy in terms of the Middle East. So this is my first point. Second point, and that's why I assume that there won't be much difference between Republicans and Democrats when it comes to their foreign policy, especially the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. However, something that also we need to take into consideration that Demo Democrats, they usually rely on soft power on diplomatic relations when it comes especially to Iran and Gulf countries. And I see from I see my analysis is that they view the Middle East and the Arab region, the power is mainly concentrated in Iran and the Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia. So first, if you look at the Democrats, the, the relationship has been uh, very neutral. They haven't used sanctions or pressure. However, when I look at Trump, I think that he will use more sanctions, more pressure, especially that both Iran and Saudi Arabia, they are in need of the U.S. power. In terms of Saudi Arabia, they need uh, U.S. weapons uh, agreements that's going between the two countries, especially with what's happening in, with the Houthis in Yemen and the war in Yemen. So the Democrats hasn't used that as a tool, but I think Trump can use that, is that he will uh, impose sanctions on Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia if they don't recognize Israel as a state. So that will be uh, a huge disadvantage on the region that when it comes to Saudi Arabia and it comes, when it comes to Iran, he has continuously uh, brought back the 2015 uh, sanction of the nuclear weapons with Iran. Uh, and Democrats have done a terrible job with this. So I think if he, when now that he's back to power, he will pressure Iran even more. And he has the advantage that when it comes to the balance of power, he has the advantage on when it comes to both Iran and Saudi Arabia. So I think by primarily not using soft power only, but also sanctions and pressures, he will have Israel and US uh, position um, kind of like surpassing the, the Middle Eastern perspective or, or our advantage in the region. Yes, please. Right here. Yeah, you. Do you mind standing and, and uh, giving us your name? My name is Yasmina Balazish. Uh, okay, so uh, I think that it would be much realistic to uh, to look back at what Trump uh, said and what he promised to do and what he actually did when he was the president last time. This would be much more realistic to compare between the idea of what he said before being a president and what he said what he said actually and what he did actually after being the president this would make make it much closer to to make a true uh, judgment before or, or avoid the idea of expecting what he would do and how he would affect affect the middle east by his actions because we did experience his presidency before, so it wouldn't be difficult as judging Kamala Harris because she wasn't the president before. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, please, in yes. the back. Uh, my name is Daria. I'm Daria. 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 Oh. I'm Russian, so I'm Okay, Daria. 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 So um, basically, I think uh, I would agree with like all my colleagues here uh, that it is not like a um, question about positive or non-positive change. I think it is uh, both. Uh, it can be used, um, Trump, uh, as we previously mentioned, uh, had already his own policy in the Middle East regarding Palestine and other uh, Middle Eastern countries. And I don't think he will, by supporting Arabs uh, during his campaign, he, I doubt he will uh, continue support that way, but he 
probably use this opportunity to gain more public support amongst uh, in comparison with uh, Kamala Harris. And I still think he will continue to support Israel policy because we already knew know how he moved the embassy and uh, had his own plan of uh, regarding Trump's roadmap. Uh, about the conflict, but also we should remember that it is not only about Palestine, it is a, we, we are talking about the whole Middle East, and maybe uh, given his isol isol isolation policy uh, that he is promoting, kind of like focusing more on the internal policy, economics, and uh, uh, his uh, like internal affairs rather than public international policy, Maybe it can be uh, the thing that he will not intervene that much, especially on the Israeli uh, activity in the Lebanon and in, um, in Palestine. Uh, however, he will not um, kind of engage, he will not engage, but he will not solve the policy itself. So it will continue, but it will be like maybe less in my mind. Uh, to my mind, it may be less than it was uh, during the Biden administration. Also, I think the being Trump and being this business type uh, worst guy, <laughs> uh, he probably can build more like economically, as I, I do agree with you, and uh, economically wise policy, especially with Saudis and his related it's their relation with Iran, because we know that the agreement between Iran and Saudi was achieved somehow by China, uh, but it can be used also as a tool to um, brush, pressure, to, like to make some pressure to the Saudis uh, in terms of their interests, in terms of uh, weapons, economy and oil as well. Um, so I think it can be both. It can be positive in terms of economic uh, relationship between other countries, not speaking about like the conflict situation, but also it can be used as a tool to influence and to make it its own interest, their okay. own interest. So, Thank yes. you, Dan. Oops. Okay, uh, let's, here's a new face. Yeah, how about you? Um, so my name is Islam Nadim. Um, so like what Maria said, that she actually pretty much summed up everything uh, I want to see. Um, I'm with this decision of having uh, Trump uh, as the president of the United States, uh, because I look at it from a pretty much like a, a different perspective, you know, say. Like, um, in my opinion, I know he, his uh, support for uh, for Israel is undeniable. Of course, we can see it uh, from changing, from his uh, closely relation uh, with Netanyahu uh, to uh, switching the uh, capital or the embassy to Jerusalem. So a couple of different things, uh, but from the perspective I see it from is, will he end the suffering of the Palestinians or this war uh, in a faster way or in a slow way? For me, I think uh, he landed faster. Like Daria said, he's a businessman. He doesn't want to spend money, and we can see it also uh, in the case of Ukraine. Um, he's against just funding the Ukrainian war. Why do I give, why as the US, why do I give this uh, this country billions and billions of dollars each year? At the same time, I'm not um, getting impact, or uh, there isn't a very direct impact to the US right now, or even in the near future. Um, so this is why, uh, um, with his mindset, I think that he'll end it uh, pretty much a bit faster. Um, I'm not saying that uh, he's you know, he's right uh, supporting Israel. No, I don't think that. But uh, this is, I think, the most suitable way to end the war, um, the most efficient way to end the war. And secondly, he's a person who built who builds alliances. He's at the end of the day, he's a businessman. He, uh, with having connections, with having this, this is how he prospered. Um, in his term, in his previous term, we saw that uh, a lot of business alliances in, in business, I mean, a lot of alliances with uh, Russia, China, um, and even North Korea. He was the first president to step on uh, the North Korean soil. Um, this doesn't specifically say that he is with them, but he, he agrees that they're a different party or an opposing party, but at the same time, we can all coexist together. Uh, and this is why, or, or this is uh, uh, evidence for me that he wants the best for his own country at least, which is to end, to uh, stop the spending this 
um, loads of money to these countries in terms of war or anything, um, and uh, to, uh, to basically stop the, all the conflicts. Uh, and actually in his term, if I remember correctly, I might not be 100% correct with my um, information, but if I remember correctly that uh, in the last two years of his term, uh, no U.S. soldier was killed in the conflict zones, which is Afghanistan, um, uh, Iraq, and in the Middle East in general, um, which actually is something good, too, because at the end of the day, we don't want conflicts. We don't want these fights. We don't want any of these things. Uh, of course, after the Biden administration came, uh, we saw a detrimental uh, thing from them. Like after 20 years, after trillions of, and trillions of dollars, um, it was a, a disaster when they were getting out of Afghanistan. And at the end of the day, Taliban came to existence, uh, not came to existence, but continued their existence normally. Uh, and on the contrary, they took control of uh, Afghanistan as a whole. Um, so um, I think this is why uh, Trump, uh, it's a good thing for Trump to be the president of the United States uh, for the Middle East and in, in general for the uh, whole world. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think we can now open the floor for debates and answering each other. So, responses. Exactly. Uh, of course, new voices are welcome at any time. But anyone want to start us off? Right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to start off with the argument that uh, Trump, uh, uh, basically, the personal attacks on Trump, I believe they are maybe red herrings, or he's a con man. Maybe he's a businessman. Businessman and con man are that different. You know, so, <laughs> but yeah, but so he's a con man. He's a, he's a Zionist. He's a this and that. I think that is a red herring. I don't think that argument stands in uh, here. Uh, but definitely, uh, but definitely, the argument about uh, uh, him being a businessman and uh, uh, trying to make up alliances and trying to. Uh, uh, so uh, resolve the issue much faster. Uh, him being a businessman, I think yeah, that definitely works. He will uh, definitely try to resolve these things faster. Not only because he's a businessman and that is all about him, Trump, Trump, and Trump, but also about the foreign policy. Because uh, Trump, as a person, there is only so much power he has. He is the president. I know he has power, but he is still limited by the foreign policy of the U.S. and the foreign policy of his party, which is the Democrats, and under which I think yeah, definitely uh, his leadership uh, paired up with the uh, policies that he has to uh, be mindful of, he can definitely uh, uh, improve Middle East, not only in terms of uh, a resolution for different violences, but also in terms of economics. So because uh, I believe the Middle East, uh, the most beneficial uh, a U.S. can be to the Middle East is uh, through economic means. It's, it has been devastating. I wouldn't say that, okay, the uh, U.S. has given the Middle East aid and that makes up for every wrong thing that they have done. Uh, I'm not saying that. All of the wrong things may still stand, but we can still are, agree that the U.S. has given a lot of financial aid to the Middle East, and that will only continue under Trump, and that will only uh, be more under Trump, because like I said, he will try and make up more economic alliances, try and make up more trade, between Middle East, Southeast Asia, and all over the world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, I really uh, liked what Islam was saying about, uh, especially about the part how uh, at the end of the day, we all want peace. So what you mentioned before about uh, the soldiers during uh, Trump's term, how like none of the US soldiers stationed in the Middle East were uh, like killed, that's a good thing, definitely. Uh, and I also liked uh, what Dario was mentioning about how we, we were talking about like the Middle East is not just the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict. Uh, as well to expand on that, so if we look at outside the Israel-Palestine conflict, we also have uh, issues mainly with Iran. As we know, Iran ha has heavy influence in Yemen, in Hezbollah, even Hamas, uh, or actually, maybe, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but yeah. Uh, so all across the region, so it's really growing. And we know that the US and Iran never had really good relations since 1979, since like the revolution. So, and Trump himself even like withdrew, I don't know if it was mentioned by you, but he withdrew uh, from the JPOT uh, deal with uh, Iran in 2000, I think 2018, uh, which was actually helped, like the deal was basically, uh, we will lift sanctions a little bit and will allow them, allow Iran to like continue with the nuclear program, but only for like non-weapon uh, issues, I think. So the fact that, that he withdrew from that and there's probably tension with Iran, that might mean that you have Iran's influence, you have Iran and Hezbollah is now like sort of part of the Israeli war. So 
maybe might uh, like Trump might stop the aid to Israel because, as we said, like he's a businessman, he doesn't want to spend all that money on foreign aid, not even to NATO, even. Uh, but maybe when it comes to Hezbollah, he might uh, have some conflict with it because of the issue of Iran. And if the Saudi and the Iranian deal does help bring the U.S. closer to Iran, it might mean like a switch in policy towards Iran. But, uh, but yeah. I just like to say that uh, first of all, it's kind of a, I believe it's not really a red herring to call Trump a con man because everyone is forgetting when you say he's a businessman and he's had like, and he's, you know, uh, elevated the economy or, what, or whatnot, they forget that he was just recently convicted of 34 charges for falsifying business records. He's not, he's by no means what, what I would call an honest businessman or a, or a, a, a smart individual, to be honest. Because if you look at his, if you look at his like tariffs, if you look at his his economic plan so far, he has he has been uh, there have been many economists that have gone out to say that his policies do not make sense and they're harmful to the U.S. economy, to the Middle East, to the world, to the global economy, and, and the global economy as a whole. And I think it's also important to 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 take a moment to also recognize what party he's standing behind, because if you look at the if you zoom out and look at the Republican Party. They're backed by the. They're backed by some populists, some some people who are very vehemently vehement, vehement, anti uh, anti Middle East. Like for example, if you look at the evangelical Christian population in the U.S., the extremist ones, just to be to be uh, direct, they they for example stand heavily with and believe that Israel is the holy land of the Jews and will um and and they they are a significant voter base in the U.S. So Trump is Trump is it's it's all it's all in Trump's favor and the Republican Party to fund this region. But the Democrat Party, on the other hand, they have said they have very pro-Palestinian senators like Bernie Sanders and AOC, who are who actually back Palestine and and question Israel's existence or their or and their genocide in Palestine. So I think that's that's important to, to note for a second. Like if you look at the Republican Party, look at Bush, everybody's forgotten the Iraq war and its consequences on the Middle East. But they they and they forget the party that was behind all of that, which is Trump's party, the Republican Party. So like, yeah, I think I think Trump's move of going into Michigan and and uh, and trying to pander to the Muslim voters was very misleading because at the end of the day, it's all a numbers game. And the evangelical Christians, the the KKK, even if you want to go as far, they have they have all uh, been pro-Israel to an extent, and. Uh, and yeah, that's that's just how that's just how it is. They're 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 more significant. They're more important to the Republican Party, while the Democratic Party has never, in recent times, wanted. Uh, they they've been much more pro-Palestinian, as as you can see with their senators, with their diversity, and uh, even even it even like carries on to their immigrant ide ideas. Like Trump recently called illegal immigrants savages and animals. And so the Haitians were eating dogs and cats, you know, in Springfield, Ohio. So he dehumanizes people, and I wouldn't put it past him if he dehumanized the Middle East. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, sure, go ahead. And then we'll get to Daria in the back as well. Now that uh, there is an issue in the Middle East uh, and another war taking place, uh, I feel that most of us may be blind uh, on referring to it, which is regarding Sudan. Mm. So who will actually support the crisis in Sudan? Trump? I don't think. I think in this specific idea, Kamala Harris will go for it due to the idea of the uh, skin color. The idea of African Americans, I think she would be better for such an issue and the economy, and she will reflect on them. I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And I would like to begin. I would like to begin that as the ideas that was sent from the public here are very relevant to what I'm about to say. We all forget about Trump's perspective on immigrants in general, his racist ideas. It is not something that is being made up. It has been proven for years now. 
uh, every time he has run, and uh, his supporters. When we look at Trump supporters, who, who were the original Trump supporters? People who wanted immigrants in general out of uh, out of the country, who wanted, uh, who ne never cared about the Middle Eastern struggles. Uh, they just wanted a better economy, uh, less prices. Even though they mistake that his policies, uh, his economic policies actually support millionaires. They, they give them tax uh, tax write offs, not that. And it has been a really common misconception that that people believe that Trump's economy is the best one, even though his policies just work on a bigger scale, if you will. A bigger scale meaning that the privileged are the ones who are benefited by his policy. And also, uh, let's not forget his vice president, for example, GD uh, GD Thomas, and what he said about the Puerto Ricans that they live on an island of Florida. Do you believe that he would not say the same thing about the Middle East? If you were given the just as a point of clarification, that was not JD Vance. That was a that, was a, that was a comedian ah, yes. uh, at a Trump event. Yes. In, anyway, sorry. So sorry. 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 I just believe that if this was the type of people who supported the Trump campaign, would they be happy if he tried to help the Middle East? Would they not uh, question his choices? Uh, I believe if anybody has any questions, I would love to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Dari, go ahead. Yeah. Actually, I would love to like to quickly address um, kind of all of my points here. Uh, first uh, point was about his business figure, like his personality and the role of the person itself. I think uh, we can relate that not only a leader is important, but also like a side and the group, the team that is in a party or like supporters um, are also important. But still, I think we will not dis will not be discussing this if we if it wasn't for uh, the, his personality, his leader, his leadership. And it's not only about the U.S. It's about like a role of the person, of the personality, of the character, uh, in the like of leader of the country in all countries. And I think even though um, he some kind of influence uh, is on the side of the parties and on the supporters, I think the most, uh, at the end of the day, it is the leader who kind of, uh, for now, especially in the United States, uh, is kind of has his own vision <laughs> and his own interests also. Uh, the second thing, uh, when I was saying about um, his business personality uh, and related to you what you said um, I think it's not about is he a good economist or is he a good businessman he's a businessman it doesn't mean he wants to like to benefit uh, the world you know at the end of the day it's his country it's the country and he uh, wants to benefit the country and uh, in his mind in his vision and in his interest what he sees what he sees and uh, what he wants. So uh, it is. It might not be the good, but it's it will it will be what he wants. And uh, the third thing about Sudan, um, I think uh, being like African American, it doesn't mean they care so much about Africans. So it is also only about international policy. They will they can relate to diversity inside the U.S., but they. I think we can see it from the history of the United States, they do not care a lot about what happening, what is happening in the region and in the Middle East, the Middle East kind of, until it's uh, not influence his their own interests. And also this the last thing about immigrants, also I think it's about it, its internal policy. They relate to them, they uh, especially Democrats, they support them, they welcome them but only like inside. They only care about it as, um, also as kind of like to oppose uh, Republicans uh, policy about not accepting uh, migrants because they also kind of, we can understand their vision. They do not want to eat for it to be uncontrollable, you know, like without having like power to control these migrants. Um, but it is, also about internal policy. It is not the international vision of the people who are living like very far away. They see them as I think, like to be very <laughs> straightforward. They see them only until 
their interests, their like personal benefits, kind of, uh, because it's policy. It's about stuff and benefits, not about emotions, I guess. Especially for Donald Trump. <laughs> I want to reflect on a point that I think most of my colleagues raised, which is peace, that he will bring peace by ending conflict. And I feel like peace is a very problematized and conceptually uh, vague word. He can, as a leader, uh, especially a Republican, can bring peace in his terms by ending conflicts, but a question that must be raised is at what cost? And this is a question that concerns me personally when it comes to Republicans, is that he, the Republicans and the personality of a leader that he is, he can come to terms with um, or end the conflict of Russia and Ukraine and Palestine and Israel. But as I said earlier, uh, through sanctions and through pressure and through the subjugation of people who cannot uh, raise their voice or have someone that on their behalf at least if we look at uh, uh, the Democrats, they have the kind of like um, uh, protecting the their uh, what they stand for in terms of human rights, what they stand for in terms of soft power. However, we we see that absence in Republicans. So when we come to see peace and conflict resolution and Republicans all in the same sentence, we have to also understand what peace means and what it can bring at the same time. So that's it. Me? Okay. So I would like to uh, mention some stuff quickly. First of all, something that personally annoys me, like why would you uh, ask if Trump or Kamala, they are like from Palestine, like we are a lot of people like we are living here, like what our country is already doing, especially the powerful one. Did they any time try to like put any pressure on them and the US or anything? We never did, you know? So this is the point. Second point, like how I see it, like, did Hamas and Hezbollah are really helping the Palestinian cause or the Lebanese cause? Like for me as a Lebanese, and I was like living in Lebanon, it was always like, as I grew up, I know that Israel is like, you know, like it's not our friend, like it's our enemy. But like before like the war, like we had also like Hezbollah, also like, uh, like destroying all what the country means, like trying to like uh, affect like the army, Lebanese army, like the borders are open, drugs are everywhere. And like how I see it, it's happening now, it's like Iran, like it's like want to do a war on Israel, but it, it doesn't want Iranian people to be involved or be killed. So yeah, let's fund like these groups like in Lebanon or in Palestine and let them like do wars on Israel for us to have like better courts when we're gonna negotiate. And then this is not helping us. This is not helping Palestine. Like despite all the destruction that is happening now in Lebanon, like Iranian like officials go up and say Lebanon and Hezbollah is gonna beat Israel. And then like, it's all like, I feel like they are hallucinating, like they use the drugs not to like sell them, they're just using them. Because like, if you look at facts, like there is nothing like to be like, and there's obviously a big project, like the Western countries wanna like end all like militias, all like, like, you know, all militias in all the Middle East, they wanna like, I feel like there's a project of peace that's gonna be, that's like countries wanna happen, like want it to happen. And as long as Israel like is attacking like militias on a big scale, like you don't see like Western like countries are very annoyed because like sometimes like like you know Israel like is like bombing everywhere, but like from Western point of view, they're gonna they'll see yeah like by the end these are like terrorist groups and then so like we're not gonna be chill about this a bit. So I feel like if Trump really affects Iranian economy, this could help us as people to like like for me to have a good country. I don't want either like, Israel to bomb me, and I don't want Iran to have its own people on my land. So I hope that like, Trump is gonna put an end to this like situation, like Iran, like giving sending money to like for other like people to defend its cause, not like each country's cause. Thank you. Okay, um, let's go back to Islam, and then I know Daria wants to respond. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. 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 So we have uh, twelve minutes left until uh, two o'clock. So.
Uh, let me just talk about it. So first of all, about the if Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris with the Democrats in general, uh, they have more like pro Palestinian figures other than Bernie Sanders with all these stuff or these people. Uh, but actually, if we look at it, first of all, she's the vice president now. Why hasn't she done any anything significant to actually help the cause and to actually help um, Palestine? Uh, this is the first thing. Second thing, uh, in my opinion, everything's controlled by him. No matter how many figures are pro-Palestinian, no matter how many figures are, yeah, we should end the, this war. It all depends. On, uh, it all depends on APAC at the end of the day and what do they really want. So this is the first thing. Uh, regarding is the economy or is the Trump's economy plan good or bad? I'm not an economist, of course, um, but my opinion is what I've heard. I've heard some people say it's good, some people say it's bad. So I guess we really have to see. But of course, it is better than uh, than Kamala's. Kamala didn't actually have a plan. She doesn't really have anything set. And when she was asked about it by the interviewers, um, she didn't really. She always lagged and said she's a middle class uh, family uh, with the, her middle class mom, and she. To whatever again. So this is the second thing. Uh, regarding Trump's, uh, is, it, is he a racist? Is he not? Uh, actually, if you look at it, and I watched a, a video about him uh, a couple of days, a couple of days ago by the um, talking about okay, is he racist? Is he not? Um, actually, he's a businessman, as we all said, and uh, as we all uh, agreed on. Um, if he's a racist, he wouldn't have become this huge influential figure. Um, his in, the industry he was in was the entertainment industry, and we all know that anything that goes against race, goes against anything, it's just cancer. We all know that. Um, so uh, I don't believe he's a racist. I believe that he's an opportunist. He sees what, where's the problem, and he addresses it. Um, for example, the part where the dogs and cats, uh, I, I've actually seen videos and um, recordings of people going down on one of, uh, and uh, explaining to them that uh, some people who look, uh, who look Hispanic, um, Indian, I don't remember the other race, that they are taking geese from the ponds uh, to actually, like, uh, in an inhumane way to go slaughter it uh, and uh, eat them at the end of the day. So this wasn't an incorrect statement by Trump. It was actually, it actually happened. He might have exaggerated, to be honest, uh, about it. Um, uh, about Kamala Harris' uh, foreign policy in Sudan, I don't really think she really do something about it uh, because she, uh, the skin color. At the end of the day, this is something that they all play on. They play on race, they play on uh, on uh, your your skin color, uh, your background, your things. But at the end of the day, these are irrelevant. And actually, this is not what happens. For for example, Trump says bad things about uh, immigrants and this stuff. But if we look at statistics uh, and we look at his term, uh, black people have the lowest unemployment rate. And we all say that he's a racist. So is that true? Statistics say otherwise. Um, so regarding uh, what our Lebanese brother said um, about the uh, Iran conflict uh, and Hezbollah and Hamas, are they good? Of course not. At the end of the day, let's see the results at the end. We see 40 plus thousand uh, people killed. We see Lebanon dragged into a war they're not in. Um, we see uh, constant bombings and constant deaths uh, and at the end of the day, Iran comes out and tells you, oh, uh, Israel will, the, the retaliation will be uh, the, the best one. They will never recover. They will, never, they will not do that and that and that. But at the end of the day, when we see Iran, it's just a couple of missiles that are not even targeted at uh, major institutions in Israel, a military institution in Israel. And there, are, there isn't a, a major um, uh, damage done to uh, Israel. So I think this is... What I tried, I tried to sum it up, sum it up real quick. Okay. So thank you guys. Thank okay. You. Thanks. Uh, Who did I say? I think I said. I, 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 I think I said. Uh, yeah, I think I said. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like the like, the girl left, but I wanted to say that. Um, uh, I actually do not agree that the Democrats probably the situation in the Middle East will be better because we saw it in the previous like, Biden administration and they. Only it, it got worse. <laughs> so uh, for me, uh, Democrats even more um, have have more interest in uh, actually voting on the, in the conflict rather than uh, kind of have this uh, is isolate like isolate this themselves from the things that go there and kind of uh, focus more on the internal policy. They actually engage more within the, with their interests. And also relating to your point, I don't think that the European countries uh, or like anyone actually wants like in the policy wise 
uh, what's peace. They, I think they still have interest up than the peace. They want to end it, but they won't end it in their terms. So basically it's all, not only related to Palestine, but it's also related to other conflicts, Ukraine uh, and uh, Africa, but African countries, I think less. Uh, Ukraine is the most priority for the European countries and uh, for like Palestine is less because of the proximity to their own borders and they still uh, even though it is right uh, next to their borders they still find their own interests their own terms for them to have peace not the terms that will achieve uh, by negotiating uh, like Israel and Palestine no they want to end it in their own terms and I don't think that involving less Iran and having this Trump uh, angelic, uh, I don't know, uh, role to end and have peace, it will be a peace on his terms. And it doesn't matter that maybe it's 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 unpredictable, unpredictable and it can be also ends up being only Israel. And that's it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to have to have one last comment. Uh, again, I've been... Uh, uh, saying Rahid, let everything go. So, Rahid, go ahead. Uh, we'll have to wrap it up. Uh, thank you. So I'll wrap it up real quick. Uh, people talked about Trump's economic policy and how it was stupid. And maybe I'll agree that if it looks like stupid, it moves around like stupid, it probably is. But at the same time, if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. His uh, public policies, economic policies, they work. And there was an argument that his economic policies are only for the rich people, the millionaires. That is the design. That is the system. Uh, uh, the government, the democratic government, is the executive committee of the bourgeoisie. Who are the bourgeoisies? The millionaires, the billionaires, the rich people. That's how it's supposed to be. So it's economic policy in their design. They, work. they might not work for us poor people, but they work for the ones that it's supposed to work for. And uh, the other uh, question about immigrants and uh, how he's anti-immigrant. Why is that a bad thing? Every country is anti-immigrant. Uh, Palestine back in the uh, 1920s when immigrants were coming in, they were anti-immigrant. Right now in India, there are Bangladeshi immigrants coming into India. India is anti-immigrant. Uh, in fact, even in India, I live in Kashmir, and there are immigrants coming from different parts of India. And we are anti-immigrant because we don't want them to affect our culture. We don't want them to... Uh, we have a system, and <laughs> we don't want them to affect it in a negative way. So being open to immigrants, letting them into your culture, it is a good thing. But at the end of the day, you need to preserve your culture. You need to preserve your language. There are, there are things that uh, you need to historically preserve. So. <laughs> Anything you want to say? <laughs> well, I had one, but I'm very, very disappointed. It was so civil. <laughs> I expecting the fight, the fireworks. And we have more time. I, I think <laughs> it was not moderated. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think also what uh, Professor Al Hadidi is also trying to say is it, it's inspiring, frankly, to come in here, to hear, hear your ideas, hear the debates. Hear the respect that you have for one another, and yet critically, uh, you know, critique one another. Uh, I hope you found this valuable, um, and um, yeah, please come back and do it again for our next uh, student yeah. debate. Stay tuned. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.